Hi, it's Alex. Today I'm going to talk about issues of consent when it comes to sex. And I want to talk about this concept that I see come up in fan fiction, and I don't really see it discussed anywhere else, and I kind of want it to be. And that concept is the idea of dubious consent, aka dubcon. So what is dubious consent or dubcon? Dubcon is when there's a situation where it's not clear whether or not a sexual interaction is consensual or not. So basically there's some situations where you can say, yes, this is consensual sex, and there are other situations where you can say, this is definitely sexual assault or rape. But there are some situations that exist in this gray area where you're not really sure. Like, maybe there's not enough information, maybe there's some really complicated confounding factors. And if you look at the sorts of things that influence ability to give consent and how consent plays out, you see that a lot of them do exist on a continuum where there's not always a clear cutoff. A really simple example of this is alcohol. I think most people would agree that there's a certain point past which, if you're drunk beyond a certain point, you can no longer give consent to sex. And people might disagree about exactly where that point is, but I think the point is, if someone's passed out as an extreme example and someone has sex with them, that's obviously rape. Uh, if someone's still conscious, but kind of barely so, I think almost everyone would also agree that that's rape if you have sex with that person. But if someone has only had like a beer or two, I think most people would say no, that's not rape if that person consents to sex. But the thing about alcohol is that it's this continuum. There's any amount that you can drink in between those two extremes. And at what point does it become rape? Like, it doesn't make sense to say, oh, this is definitely not rape, and then there's like this absolute cutoff of a certain blood alcohol limit after which it becomes rape. Like, that just is not how the world works. It doesn't make any sense. To me, it makes sense to say that there is this pretty broad area in the middle where you're not really sure whether or not the person can consent to sex. This idea, this thought, can be uncomfortable to some people. I've noticed this in a lot of discussions surrounding sexual assault or rape. And I've noticed this tendency that people have that it really bothers me, actually. There's this thing that goes on. Someone will come into some internet forum or they'll come before their friends to get help or support based on a situation that happened that they were involved in recently or in the past. And they describe the situation, and I've noticed that people often will jump in and they're like, oh, that was sexual assault, that was rape, you were raped. And sometimes other people will be like, no, I don't think that was rape, that was definitely not sexual assault, things like that. And sometimes people will argue about this, like back and forth between these two extremes. And this really, really bothers me. It bothers me for a lot of reasons. For one, it's this emotionally charged topic. It's often being discussed with or in front of the person who went through the experience, so they may have trauma associated with it, and you're starting to argue about this experience. And it can be hard on the person for multiple reasons. Like, for one, if the person really thinks that they were raped or sexually assaulted, and people are telling them that they're not, that that's not what happened, it's denying and invalidating their experience. And this can come across as sort of re-traumatizing. But similarly, if the other person doesn't feel like they were raped or sexually assaulted, they're just like, oh, this was a kind of icky or weird situation, and people keep telling them, no, you were raped, you were raped, over and over again, that in itself can be kind of traumatizing. And I've seen this happen, and I think that there's a stigma associated with rape, and I think if, if people are told that that is what happened to them when that's not what they really believe, that itself can also be traumatizing. So, okay, 
I think it's important to exercise caution when analyzing other people's situations, especially in front of that person and talking to that person themselves. And how does DoveCon relate to this? Well, I think that the biggest problems with this kind of behavior exist when they're in this gray area, when the situation that happened fits into this area where you cannot cleanly or unambiguously say this was consensual or this was non-consensual. Because that's where you're going to have more diversity of viewpoints and you're going to have people potentially arguing about whether or not something was consensual. How can we solve this or prevent this? I think, I think a lot of this problem can be prevented by acknowledging that dubious consent Dubcon is a real thing. It doesn't just exist in fan fiction, it exists out in the real world. And what that means is that there are situations out there where you cannot unambiguously say this was consensual or this was non-consensual. There's some situations that are just in that gray area, people might not always agree, and people like me might say, hey, this is definitely in that dubious category that I, I'm not going to put it in either one. I think it's important to acknowledge that. I want to throw out some more examples of how this can come up. So I gave the example of alcohol. Similar thing can play out with other drugs. And again, with drugs there's always this continuum of how they affect you, so there's not like a clear cutoff of when you can and can't give consent. Another example is age. So there's a pretty widespread agreement that when you're young beyond a certain point, you can't give consent legally. And this is why you have things like statutory rape. But I really don't believe that the law determines morality. Like, does it become magically okay to have sex with someone the minute they reach the age of consent? That doesn't make sense to me, because people's emotional development is continuous. It's gradual and it basically it, it's an ongoing thing. It, it's not like this BAM one category to another category. Now the law may need to have cutoffs for some reason, but the point is if you're talking about the ethical status of a situation, is this consensual, is this not consensual, and age is involved because someone is particularly young, I think that there can be some gray area there too. Um, there's some other examples that come up. One of them is when there is a lack of clear verbal communication. So for example, say someone says, yes, I want to do this thing, and then their body language says that they're not comfortable with it. Well, body language is complex and it can be ambiguous itself. It can be difficult to read. How you read the body language can be filtered through a person's past experiences, through cultural differences. You can also have factors like neurodiversity that can make it hard for people to read certain nonverbal signals. For example, people on the autism spectrum sometimes have a tougher time reading certain types of nonverbal cues. So these are a whole bunch of examples of how the communication itself can be muddled. It can be unclear, and that can lead to situations of dubious consent. Verbal communication, it can be subject to language differences, cultural differences. Verbal communication is not perfect either. So basically, there's a long list of ways in which consent can get complex, it can get ugly. Lastly, I want to say, just because I think dubious consent exists, doesn't mean that I think it's a good thing to get into these situations or be in these situations. I think it is very important to unambiguously get consent. Like, make sure you're always fully in the consensual category in your interactions. And that involves both making sure you get the other person's consent, and making sure that you are communicating your consent or lack of consent to the other person very clearly. Don't leave any room for gray area. I think this would solve a lot of problems. Where is the gray area important when analyzing what happened with other people. Don't try to force it into a yes-no situation if it's not clear, because it can be very traumatizing to the people who have been in these situations, regardless of whether you're 
sort of misclassifying it in the yes consensual or no non-consensual category. That's what I have to say. Um, I hope you've gained some insight, I hope this has been thought-provoking, and I'd love to hear from you if you have any questions about any of this or anything to add. Thank you!